Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 30th, 2016, and my guest is Angus Deaton of Princeton University and Nobel Laureate in Economics. He has written widely on poverty, health, economic development, and he appeared previously on Econ Talk in November of 2013 discussing his book, The Great Escape. Angus, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's wonderful to be back. Thank you very much, Russ. Our topic for today is a recent essay you wrote with the title, Do We Need to Rethink the Robin Hood Principle? What is the Robin Hood Principle you're referring to? Well, as everybody, I think the common understanding would be the Robin Hood Principle is taking from the rich and giving to the poor. Um, what I had in mind is a somewhat more technical um, concept, um, which philosophers nowadays call prioritarianism. I always have a hard time saying that word. <laughs> Um, but uh, that name, I think, comes from the philosopher Derek Parfit, but Parfit, but it was introduced into the literature by Serge Calm and perhaps um, most importantly by Tony Atkinson in a paper in 1969. And this is the idea that somehow um, giving an extra dollar um, to a rich person is worth less than giving... Um, an extra dollar to a poor person. And so the world would be a better place if you could do that, um, which is take money from a rich person, give it to a poor person, provided you didn't flip them. So provided the rich person always stays richer than the poor person, then bringing them close together. So it's a sort of egalitarian principle. And why would we need to rethink it? I mean, I can think of lots of reasons, but why do you think we need to rethink it? (laughs) Well, I've been thinking it, thinking about it. I mean, I was brought up on that. Actually, the first seminar I ever heard in my professional life was Tony Atkinson presenting that paper. I was very impressed. I thought maybe all papers in economics were <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, why am I rethinking it? I'm not sure we need to rethink it. And it's clear that many people really do believe in that principle. Um, and indeed, it's the foundation of modern tax theory, um, the writings of, say, Atkinson and Murleys. I think Piketty would certainly be committed to this. Um, and so it, it's, uh, you know, it seems like a fairly general principle that a lot of people would subscribe to. So there's the version of it that I was talking about in that essay is You could imagine lots of reasons for revising it even within a country, but I was thinking about it in terms of the whole world. So, for instance, if you're what I christened, and I think it's a name in the philosophical literature, a cosmopolitan prioritarianist, it would say that you sort of rank all the people in the world, no matter who they are, where they live, whether they're in Australia, the Central African Republic, Switzerland, or Iowa, um, and you give priority to the richest ones. Sorry, you give us priority to the poorest ones, no matter where they live. So that essay that you read about rethinking Robin Hood was in part a factual one, which is, is it really true, as we've always assumed, or assumed for as long as I've been thinking about these things, that the really poorest people in the world are not in the United States, and uh, there's no one in the United States who's as poor as people in Africa or in India or where, wherever you go, wherever you want to go. So it was a purely factual thing. And then there's the question, the philosophical question, as to whether cosmopolitan, cosmo, the cosmopolitan bit of that is right, which is shouldn't we give some extra priority to our fellow citizens Um, because they are our fellow citizens, um, as opposed to just treating everybody in the world as if we were all in one country together. I guess my first thought 
which isn't what I was thinking of when I read the essay, which has a lot of other things in it that we'll get to. But my first thought is that I don't think it's anyone's job or role or um, or is it desirable that we play with the income distribution in that way. I don't see. So, for example, uh, certainly many, many of the poorest Americans are better off than a, a great deal better off than the poorest people on the face of the earth. And I would certainly not want to justify redistributing income away from them toward poor people outside the United States. But nor would I be against um, economic events that cause that to happen. And I think that's really what is at the heart of your of your essay, at least the part that struck home with me, which is in pursuing – uh, a more global trading regime, a more open uh, border situation for goods to, to circulate around the world, it is possible that that has greatly improved the well-being of, say, people in China, that, that hundreds of millions of people have escaped the worst kinds of poverty, while at the same time that may have harmed somewhat uh, the poorest, lowest skilled Americans. And I think that's possibly true, and, and I think it is something that every economist who's in favor of free trade should think about. Is it fair to say that that's a piece of what you are thinking about? It's a piece of it, um, for sure. And I agree with um, what you just said, and I listened to your excellent um, interview with David Otter um, on these topics. And I think it's very, very, very important. I'm not sure how many times I want to say very there. Keep that going. If you're thinking about globalization and its discontents or whatever perspective, you acknowledge the first fact that you acknowledge there, which is that hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty because of this. And these people in China and those people in India, and it's not just China and India, but they're the countries with the biggest numbers, have been brought out of ultra terrible destitution um, by globalization. So if you're going to start bitching about globalization because of what it does to people in rich countries, then you've always got to keep that in the other pan of the scales, as it were. And, you know, that doesn't mean that there aren't people in rich countries who weren't hurt by this, but however you await those things, you've got to acknowledge that fact. Agreed. And so let's take that as agreed ground. The bit I'm not so sure was what you said before that, and this is the factual matter that I've been rethinking. It's very, very, very difficult to measure. There I'm doing multiple varies again, but it's really quite hard to measure. I spent a lot of my life thinking about global poverty and actually measuring it is really difficult. And so here is a factual question, which turns out to be extraordinarily difficult to answer, which is, is it really true what you said a minute ago, that the poorest people in the United States are orders of magnitude better off than the poorest people in India or the poorest people in the Central African Republic. And I'm not so sure of that anymore. Why? Um, well, um, partly, um, first of all, the um, purchasing power parity corrections that are done for global poverty are supposed to really make things right across countries so that, you know, a dollar a day means the same in the United States as it is in India. And the dollar a day and its successor lines, dollar twenty five and now about two dollars, have been very successful, I think, among the very successful rhetorically for the international development industry hmm. because no one can imagine living in the United States on a dollar, even two dollars a day. So people think, you know, two dollars a day is the global standard of poverty. There is no one in the United States who lives on two dollars a day because it's basically impossible. Okay. So the question is, is that really true? And there are various strands of work that have 
disturb that a little bit. First of all, one of the things you can do now, which is sort of delightful that you didn't used to be able to do, is you can go and take one of these bundles and you can price it around the world. You know, you can go to a supermarket in California or a supermarket in Britain or a supermarket in South Africa or in India and figure out what these things cost, at least for food, not so easy for rent and all the rest sure. of it. And it turns out if you're just talking about food, um, you could actually manage um, on $2 a day in the U.S., you know, if you take a bundle, and of course it's not a very luxurious bundle and it doesn't have lots of things in it you might want, but you can get enough calories and fats and things like that um, from as far as food is concerned for less than two bucks a day. Yeah, but wait, um, hang on. Certainly, yeah. certainly your original skepticism about the prevalence of $2 a day or less poverty in the United States wasn't because you can't survive – but because no, 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 no. I understand most that. people make more than two dollars a day. <laughs> this is just a riff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Most Sorry. People make more than most people make two dollars a day. So that's right. Um, it's just part of the story, I think. So for a long time, I thought that two dollars a day it, it was physically impossible even to get enough food to live on in the U.S. on two dollars a day, and therefore the statement that people, everybody in the U.S. had way more than that was true. So I was talking. That's from the consumption side. Um, but you could ask, well, what about their incomes? Yeah. Well, um, let's first of all, none of the two dollar a day stuff around the world is done in terms of incomes. Um, because incomes just aren't measured in most of the world. So you're actually, you know, calculating the values of com commodity bundles that people consume. So if you, and what's more is if you look at in India um, and Africa, where they're counting the number of people living on $2 a day, there's no charge in there for housing whatsoever. It's just not counted. <laughs> there's no charge in there for health care. It's not counted. There's no charge in there for education. It's just not counted, right? In India, there's a constitutional requirement that the state provide education. Of course, it doesn't. Um, there's a constitutional requirement that the state provide health care. Of course, it doesn't. But when they do the poverty numbers and they make them up, they calculate them that way. The household surveys they use don't have those items in them. Um, or they may have a tiny bit of them, the, the out-of-pocket expenditure that people do. Um, and so the comparison of just saying food versus food, in some sense, is more relevant than you might have thought. Um, of course, people will say, well, people in the U.S., you know, really poor people have access to Medicaid. You know, they have access to all sorts of stuff. Um, but... <laughs> You know, that's the, you know, if you're doing like with like, um, you wouldn't really want to include that stuff. So then this thing gets much, much more murky. And then I can come to, you know, Kathy Eden's book about living in America and $2 a day, about which, you know, there's been a lot of dispute, but it's an eye opening book. And what turns out from that book and the book that got a lot of attention, Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted is that for the poorest people in the United States who are in this sort of unstable bottom end of the labor market, they may also have some um, mental health issues, you know, or they may not be fully abled in various other ways, health ways, that housing is just a nightmare. And I think it's probably gotten worse in recent years. So if you're at the bottom of the income distribution, you know, if you can get a job, and, and the argument in Kathy Eden's book is that the end of welfare as we knew it, the sort of workfare part of that has really worked pretty well in the sense that those people's lives are pretty good when they're at work. You know, a job in Walmart is just terrific compared with what they face at home. And what they face at home is just the impossibility of finding a place to live, especially if you lose your job. So when you say that we ought to take more account of our fellow citizens and looking at the impact of, say, trade policy or immigration, whatever it is, you're not you're not giving up on your cosmopolitanism. You're suggesting that maybe our fellow citizens are lower down in the uh, rankings than we might have thought and deserve more consideration. Is that accurate? Um, almost. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> and that I'm suggesting they are much further. There's a factual bit of this, which is that we're, um, 
we're thinking they may be much further down in the income distribution than we think we are. They are. And I don't want to press that too hard because, you know, there are all these issues about how do you account for Medicare and so on, Medicaid. I mean, you can't buy food with Medicaid. You can't buy rent with Medicaid. But, of course, it's very valuable when you need it. Um, so I'm not knocking any of that stuff. But I just wanted to introduce into the argument that it's not so clear where the poorest Americans are um, in this world income distribution, if you were a cosmopolitan. So, and of course, some of these people are like people living in the Mississippi Delta, Delta, who are incredibly poor, and they haven't been affected by globalization at all. So, you know, I resist the notion that it's all to do with globalization or automation or whatever. There's a lot of poor people in America, you know, who don't have anything to do with that. Yeah, but I, I wonder about that. I, I, how many, how many Americans? This is an empirical question that I do not know the answer to, and I don't know if anyone knows the answer to it, but it is answerable. I think there's an answer probably in somewhere in Arkansas to this question uh, in the town of Bentonville. But but my question is, how many Americans live within 20 miles of a Walmart? Is it – what percentage? Is it 90? Is it 60? Is it 40? That's a good question. Uh, so that person in the Delta that you're – Thinking of um, may you, have access to yeah government. because they're getting really cheap clothes and really cheap toys for oh, their yeah, kids. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, I'm on your side as far as that's concerned. I mean, I I'm not on your side in the sense that I think there are no losers from this. Oh, I don't, oh no, I don't think I, that at all. Oh, right. please, I, okay. I don't think there are okay. no losers. I think there are a lot of people who have, who have lost in the short. All right, that's all. In the short yeah. run, the the question is. What is – I think there's there's two questions. First of all, as as I said in the Otter episode, and I will continue to say it, uh, economists who claim that free trade is good for everybody in the literal sense that everybody's better off after uh, a trade agreement or trade barriers are brought down, uh, that's a lie. It's dishonest. Um, it's just simply not true. You can save well, that. People say that all the time. I know. They shouldn't. Yeah, they they should by the minimum wage too. They, they should reduce Right. It's yeah. wrong. It's it's a form of um, uh, intellectual hucksterism in my in my view. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, there's a subtler view, which I would would I would which I would attribute to my uh, friend and former colleague Don Boudreau at George Mason, who argues that trade generally makes all of us better off. But any one piece of trade could harm one of us, some of us in particular, uh, because of competition. Just like any increase in competition could be harmful in the short run. Uh, or the very long run, uh, which is, I think, part of what, what, uh, or at least the semi-long run, which is what I take David Otter and his co-authors to be saying, that some of the ability of the American worker to adjust to these changes is very limited, and they may have lower wages for a fairly long period of time or may struggle okay. to find work. So I think we agree on that, right? That's not – Yeah. No, we're, we're all on the same page here. But I wanted to come back to the other bit of your question, which is there's the factual question of where these people are in the world income distribution. The second question is whether I'm a cosmopolitan or not, and I'm not. So I don't believe in cosmopolitanism. Um, Continue. And I think there are lots of reasons for that. So even if we knew where they were in the world income distribution, I do think our fellow citizens um, deserve um, – more different and somehow special consideration that you would not give to people in India or the Central African Republic. And this is a very unpopular view. So I got yelled that <laughs> for saying that in, in this piece. There's an interesting piece too. I don't know if you've read um, Paul Theroux's book no. uh, about the Deep South. So I think it's called, well, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's his most recent book. And it's about multiple visits to the Deep South in the U.S. And, you know, he'd written all these books about Africa and so on. Right. And he claimed in an op-ed piece in the New York Times that these people in the Deep South, the poor people in the Deep South, were way poorer than anyone he'd ever met in Africa, for instance. And again, was denounced. Um, you know, by all the usual voices saying this is just ridiculous. You have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I do know what I'm talking about. And I think he might be right. But there's just this philosophical question 
about whether you should think differently about your fellow citizens than you should think about your non-fellow citizens. And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, I just come back from Montana. That's where they send the kids to fight. You know, you meet people who've had six kids, all of whom have been in the military. You know, where I live around here, right. I know a couple of people whose kids have been in the military. You know, the population of India doesn't get to serve in our military or our sort of court. Well, of course, is too strong a word, but, you know, they don't have great other opportunities if you grow up in NS Montana, um, which is where we are. And so I think we owe people something for that. And we have a veterans administration and we have various benefits that come to veterans. We revere our veterans. Um, you know, we pay a lot of attention to them. I think that's right. And, you know, if we want to go on some madcap military adventure somewhere in the world, then, you know, the population of Punjab doesn't have to go and do it for us. Well, that's so, you know, I, I, yeah, well, I think that's something of a red herring, perhaps. Let's take the more uh -huh. basic point that that people growing up in rural Mississippi and rural Montana for a variety of reasons find the military attractive and for a variety of reasons maybe struggle to get integrated into the information economy that you and I are a part of, the service economy that you and I are a part of that happens to pay very well as opposed to some of the other parts. Um, the only point I would make, and I, I would, well, let's just make this point that the reason that somebody is desperately poor in uh, in Mississippi is not the same reason somebody is desperately poor in parts of India or Africa. Uh, it, here in America, you are very near very prosperous places where they speak your language, um, where you may have relatives nearby, where it's somewhat familiar. And yes, we put up a lot of barriers to that kind of movement, which I think is wrong. Those are, you know, we've made housing a lot more expensive in urban areas, I think artificially more expensive. That's a terrible thing. Um, and that's made it harder for people to move. And it's created some forms of, of uh, effective borders. And I think that's a mistake. But the economy as a whole in the United States is, quote, thriving. Not every single piece of it, but overall thriving relative to to parts of, say, sub-Saharan Africa, I don't think it's productive to think of them as anything remotely similar, even if there are indeed people for personal tragic reasons who didn't finish school, who didn't – who have trouble with, with mental health issues, et cetera, in, in parts of America. Yeah, I think that's probably right. So I'm, I'm not going to fight it. And also I thought you were going to make a different argument, which is, you know, we have an all-volunteer force. I was going to make that too, uh, but I'd left that alone. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Too easy for that. <laughs> yeah. um, so that, you know, you could say the military is making opportunities for these people, and it's a good thing, and we don't owe them anything for fighting for us or nothing special that we nothing haven't already special. paid. yeah. Well, we don't behave that way, right? You know, we, we have, you know, we don't have an Arlington National um, Cemetery for pediatricians, for instance, yep. or, you know, other people. Entrepreneurs. So I think we, I think we think we owe something to those people. So that's one thing. I don't disagree, thing, but I just want to say I don't disagree with the fact that people who put their life on the line deserve something special, even if the wages were enough to attract them in there. I have no problem with honoring them b b way beyond that. And I think part of the reason we do that is because we want to attract a certain kind of person into that profession, right. not just for the money. So I just okay. I mostly agree with you. Yeah. All right. But I mean, you do agree that it's a little, that's something that's different between, it's part of our social contract, which is not there for someone who lives in India, for example. That's true. Agreed. Um, so the other thing I think is that, um, you know, cosmopolitan philosophers believe that national, the way they like to put it is that national boundaries have no ethical significance. <laughs> right, yep. so they're sort of arbitrarily lines on a map, yep. and it's clear that there are parts of Africa where that's pretty much literally true because a bunch of colonialists came along with a bunch of maps and yep. drew some lines <laughs> for their own convenience. But for instance, you know, I grew up 
in Scotland, and I think the border between England and Scotland, even though it's not a national border, and even though, you know, people have farms that span the border and commute across it and everything else, that there's something different about being Scots. And there's a whole national heritage, um, which we're very proud of, or in some cases not so very proud of, you know, when we burn a bunch of people in caves or something. Um, but, you know, there, there's something that, that these, the cosmopolitan philosophy just does not recognize, um, which is there's something there of a national identity, which is very important. And it means we treat other Scots differently than we treat other people from very far away. Now, there are limits on that. It doesn't mean we ignore people who are far away and have no obligations to them. And it's a limited set of spheres of things that you really care about. Um, but there's something there that's not recognized by the fact that these borders are sort of arbitrary impositions that were put there by mindless colonial bureaucrats, for instance. So it's not entirely clear what you do with that. And I don't think the philosophical literature is always very clear about that either. I mean, the, the cosmopolitanism is very easy because you say everybody's the same and we just ignore these stupid borders and we ignore politics and nationalism and all the rest of it. But, you know, there are parts of nationalism that are real and make some sense and are important to people like religion or something. And actually, Rawls wrote this book called The Law of Peoples which Rawlsians don't read and they don't like it very much because it's very anti-Rawlsian. Hmm. And he says, you know, world government would be the ultimate tyranny. And that, you know, <laughs> nations have the rights to do things for themselves and not be part of this thing. Well, competition and, you know, is a good thing. Yeah. And the world government. And also they're different. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, even, you know, when I come back from Montana, I always think that Washington is tyrants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the people in Montana, I mean, it's sort of like if there was a world government, people in Kenya would be being ruled to some extent from Washington. We Scots don't much like being ruled very much from London, and people in Montana don't like much being ruled from Washington. Agreed. Um, because they think they have all sorts of tastes and things that are important to them that are not fully recognized by the people who lord it over them. I think I think there's two questions here, uh, which are somewhat conflated by this uh, position you're taking on national borders. Uh, culture matters a ton. National identity matters a ton. Um, the unique vision of America as a land of liberty, I think, has made a big difference in the world, and not just for the the millions of people who've had the opportunity and privilege to live here. It actually infuses daily life less so maybe than it once did, but I think it still does. And crossing that border and being born uh, a few miles to the south in Mexico or a few miles to north in Canada can make all the difference. Uh, so borders matter, but the question is whether they should matter ethically. And then the more important question is whether they should matter economically in our ethical c consideration. And by that, I mean, if, if you make a product in Texas that competes with my product in Maryland – and that puts me out of work, but makes a lot of Americans better off who prefer your product to my product. I don't know why that's really different if you move your factory five miles to the south and your factory is called a Mexican factory. And suddenly it's a Mexican factory that's making Americans better off and making me worse off. I think that's the key question. We think about how the, the tendency to truck barter, the propensity, excuse me, the to truck barter and exchange that your fellow Scotsman Adam Smith talked about, I think he was making a very deep point that where it came from, where that – who you were trading with is not so important for whether we should be open to buying it or not. And that if we are not open to buying it, if we close our national borders, if we close our state borders, if we close our town's borders, we will be desperately poor. I agree with that. Um, and I didn't – I did not – Go that far. No, no, I know you, you didn't, but there's a temptation. <laughs> you made a bit of I know a, a reductive. You, go that way. you made a but, bit I of. I mean, you don't have to. You don't have to go all that way to recognize that there are 
issues over which people care on this. And you might want to say, you want to be very, very careful here because they care about issues that are actually going to impoverish them, even if they think it's going to make them better off. So I think the cosmopolitan impulse is, is a very worthy one, a very good one. But I think some of these issues that on issues where you think we would lose our Scottishness or we would you know, impinge on our historical thing, um, historical heritage, then you'd want to be a bit careful there, which gives them some moral significance. I'm not That's saying, great. I'm not arguing for, you know, complete autarky or any nonsense like that. I mean, we don't want to turn ourselves into Albania or actually Albania is not like that anymore <laughs> <laughs> or, or North Korea. But let me do a third thing then, which is something that the philosopher Dworkin argued about a lot. So let's see these national, national borders exist, you know, even if they were arbitrarily drawn by crazy colonialists. Um, then once you're in one of these things, whether you want to be there or not, you are subject to all sorts of laws and customs that you have no option over. All right. Correct. So, for instance, you have to obey the laws. Um, they may be laws that you don't like. Um, and so you're in a sort of contract with other people in that thing. And you say, well, you get some benefits from living in this country, but at the same time, you have certain obligations. Those may be to serve in the military, but that's not the end of it. You have to serve on juries. You have to obey the laws. You have to drive at a speed that people think you want to drive at. And so these are obligations that you have and foreigners don't have. Um, and so there certainly comes a bunch of obligations to fellow citizens. And again, we could agree or disagree or talk about how extensive these obligations are. And that bit of the, the op-ed got sort of chopped and made much shorter. Hmm. And all I, I'd wanted to raise the military thing, which isn't in there, but um, I talked about this insurance arrangement, but I do think that's important. I mean, there are... Most nations have insurance arrangements of one sort or another, you know, which limit the operation of the market, um, whether it's old age pensions or whether it's um, national health care um, or whether it's a safety net, you know, and these vary obviously enormously from country to country, but you're locked into that contract, whether you like it or not. Um, once you're in that nation and in that nation, that gives you certain rights, it gives you certain obligations, and it gives you certain benefits. And other people outside the country are not part of that. Yeah. So I just think I it's nonsense to line up everybody in the world, you know, on a scale of one to seven billion and say, who's the richest, who's the poorest. And even if we could, which thank God we cannot, um, would it be if you, you know, could bring yourself, which I doubt either of us could, to think that world redistribution was a good idea, which a lot of people think. Yes, I mean, you know, the World Bank and the international organizations, all these people are sort of somehow dedicated to this proposition that redistribution of income making a more equal world um, would be a really good thing. Then I don't think you could do it that way. Um, you would have to recognize the national borders in some part of that formula. So that's a really, that's an interesting point that I I don't, as you suspect, didn't shine through that piece as well as it could have um, because you can get to say exactly what you wanted. But I think the other point to make in response to that is that it's all well and good to say uh, the top billion should be giving up money to the bottom billion. But it's a very different thing to say, well, we're going to pretend the top billion are giving up to the bottom billion. But it really goes to the the thousand in the bottom billion countries who happen to be living quite well, according to Western standards even, and they siphon it off for themselves. And that to me, I mean, it's one thing to have a thought experiment about whether I should feel morally obligated to give up my some of my own money, either for my fellow citizens who are poorer than I am or for citizens around the world, but to do so and have it go to enhance the power of the richest people in those poorest countries to further subjugate their fellow citizens is a horrifying thought, which I'm afraid is something of what has actually happened. And that's what I write about in the last chapter of The Great Escape, which we talked about yeah. before. I mean, I think, you know, it's nonsense. I mean, if you, I, I, I don't know if we talked about this, but one of the examples I like to give is that some cult member moves in next door, you know, with a wife that he subjugates. And, you know, he exploits that wife and 
makes that wife do all sorts of things for him. So he lives in the lap of luxury while this woman is essentially a slave. And you would like to do something about it. Then. You know, giving him money doesn't seem like the best thing to Correct. do. Um, no. Giving her money is a complete waste of time because it goes straight to him. Yeah. And then when you think that through, maybe it'd be actually better to give money to him provided you put some conditions on it. Um, and even that won't work if your next door neighbor says, well, why are you giving, putting horrible conditions on that guy? I'll give it to him for free. Yeah. And so then you get in a competition with your neighbors to see who can share the most money on this guy who laughs all the way to the bank. Or you can put conditions on him that he pretends to. To follow, but it doesn't actually. Yeah, that's right. Uh, before we move on, and we're going to move on, I want to I want to move on to this issue of uh, I have a couple of things I want to add to this discussion. I just want to go back and put a footnote to the earlier conversation we had, the earlier part of the conversation, because I think it's so important. I made the point that you agree with that there are people who who are harmed by any particular opening of the of certain trade. Uh, restrictions, reduction of certain trade restrictions, or just through technology, through all kinds of reasons. Um, there are people who we have a dynamic economy, there's creative destruction, and I think it's dishonest of, of any side to say every everything is, quote, good for America, implying that that's good for every American, and it's certainly not true. At the same time, I think it's really important to point out that over time, and this is why I kept making this short run, long run distinction that economists get mocked for, but I think it's incredibly important in the long run, meaning in a generation or two, the children and grandchildren of that worker are almost always better off than than the um, than their parents were before them. And that's not a coincidence. That's part and parcel of accepting the dynamism of the economy. I often use the example of agriculture. Certainly it has been it was not easy on the farmers of America to watch farming go from forty percent of employment to two percent of employment in the United States over the last hundred or so years. Many people dreamed their kids would own farms. They couldn't. Many children dreamed they would own those farms. They couldn't make that work because of technological change and consolidation of larger farms being more efficient. And so fewer and fewer people were necessary to grow even enormously greater amounts of food. That's a glorious thing for almost everyone except farmers. But it's even good for farmers if you count their children and grandchildren, and they would. A farmer in 1900 who's told, I have bad news for you. Your sector is going to be devastated by technological change. Your children and grandchildren will not grow up to do what you do and what you dream of them doing. But don't worry. Here's what their life looks like. They wouldn't say, oh, that's a terrible deal. Don't do that to me. They'd say, thank you. My children will live long. They will have rich lives of meaning. And they will also have tremendous material well-being. So I, I think this whole idea of merely looking at the fact that, say, trade with China makes life hard for some people – and I concede that, and it's a tragedy, and we ought to find ways to make it easier for people to deal with. And I'm uncomfortable saying it, as you, I think, are also, given that I have not ba paid any particular price from that. I get all the benefits and a few of the costs. But I don't think the costs are imposed on the poorest Americans, say, in the manufacturing sector with only a high school education. They are right now, but I think their children and grandchildren will live richer lives for it. At least that's my justification for open borders, not some Pollyannish everybody benefits and the gains from trade will all be well distributed tomorrow. They won't be. But in a couple tomorrows, I think they will be. Well, I think the factual matter, that's right. Whether everybody would make that choice for their grandchildren, I'm a little more pessimistic about human nature than you are. Well, fair enough. <laughs> Let's move to a different but not unrelated point, which is money versus meaning. So, you know, one of the issues here, the way this debate often gets framed until recently was, was about material well-being, which counts. But as economists, again, even though everyone thinks that's all we care about, it's not all we care about and it shouldn't be all we care about. And so for me, the fundamental issue about these, these changes that we're talking about, these dramatic changes due to trade or globalization or aid, they're about what people's – the texture of their daily lives, not just how much food they can put on their table. Right. I think, you know, some of what Paul Theroux was arguing about the Deep South is that, you know, the cultural texture in which many, but certainly not all people in Africa live, um, may make it much easier to live on almost nothing than the cultural texture in the United States. And I think that that's what comes through 
very brutally in both the Desmond book and the Kathy Eden book. I mean, I believe in both of these situations, you're out of equilibrium. You know, some of it is there's a lot of government programs in there that aren't working and are arguably making things worse. Um, and, you know, so maybe that's a transition. That's not the way either of them would see it. Um, but it's just that whatever safety net we have for many of these people is clearly not working and whatever social structure would have been there that might be there in Africa, it might be there in India, is not working either. So I, I'm not on very sure ground here because it's also true that, um, you know, I've been in villages in India where people don't have enough to eat and talking about social structure and, you know, everything's okay there. You know, that doesn't cut much ice with me either. Yeah. You know, if you're watching your kids dying and, um, you know, you don't have enough to eat and you're being brutalized and you're treated more or less as a slave, you know, that may be a better description of a lot of people in the world than saying they're happy, poor people living in a, you know, a caring society. Yeah, I, I don't think we should romanticize any kind of poverty ever. Um, but I do think, not having read the Paul Theroux book, but I do think there's a difference in how people deal with low levels of income or better way to say it is other things matter. If you're not dying, if you're not starving to death, certainly there are many consolations in life, uh, which we all have regardless of our income level that make life not just tolerable, but but delightful. And I think there is a tendency, one of the results of our individualistic and liberty and tolerant culture of America is that some people get left behind and we don't force them to do things anymore uh, like we used to. We used to lock up people who were really different and we called them crazy and we put them in insane asylums. And I'm glad we don't anymore, but I'm not going to tell you that they have an easy life the way they live now. They didn't either before. It's a fundamental challenge. But I, I, I do think that how people uh, get by and what gives their life meaning is goes way beyond the paycheck, the size of the paycheck. I think that's true. But as we were saying a minute ago, I mean, you know, extreme poverty can really destroy that. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And we also know which way the correlations go. So if you look at almost any of these other things, to the extent we can measure them, um, you know, they're graded with income. Yep. That doesn't mean that everybody is. Um, correlation, we're talking about correlations that are way less than one. But, you know, there's a lot more sickness. Um, there's a lot of bad stuff. Um, goes on among poor people, which compromises the quality of their lives. No doubt about it. But don't you think there is a view that's that's arising now that maybe it's in your piece or maybe it's not. You tell me and you tell me what you really think. But there's this view that there's an arrogance of the elites and that the underclass perceives this and feels they are not getting respected. And I you know, I, I want to take that argument seriously, and at the same time, it's the kind of argument that an elite person would cook up for feeling guilty about something that maybe doesn't exist. So um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, it's hard, right, aren't we? We're the elite. So, you know, even if you think you're trying to think through this honestly, um, you know, the old saying that what you think depends on where you sit is, you know, you always ought to keep that you in mind. Keep, yeah. We do the best we can. Um I do think that here and in Europe and in Britain, people have sort of, to a large extent, felt that they're excluded from the political processes that are important for them. And that I think that's largely true. I mean, I was very persuaded by Larry Lessig's book, for instance, and I thought that, you know, it really has become a problem in the U.S. that there's really no very well-defined political structure for many of these people. I mean, we used to have unions, and God knows unions had lots of terrible problems, but there was some political representation for a lot of those working-class people, and that's gone. Um, and so I'm not sure anymore. I mean, the Democrats seem to be they have the same needs for money that the Republicans have. But, you know, it can't be entirely um, 
you know, that because money is much less important in Europe, and yet there's a tremendous amount of disaffection in Europe too. So, you know, I think that's a puzzle that we don't fully understand. You know, Anne Case and I wrote this paper in November last year um, about the rising mortality rates among, you know, white midlife non-Hispanics, which is much most extreme among people who have um, a high school degree or less. Um, and this rising mortality is not entirely driven, but the biggest categories are rising suicide rates, rising drug addiction to mostly prescription drugs, um, and overdoses from oxycontin content and the like, um, and alcoholism. Um, those are nothing to do with the healthcare system. They're all to do, well, they are, but you know, these are behavioral conditions, not an infectious disease of some sort. Um, well, and possibly it goes the, the other yeah. direction. It's possible that the healthcare system is subsidizing those drug habits. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think there's a lot of what we call iatrogenic medicine going on there, yeah. um, which is that, you know, oxycontin. I mean, <laughs> you know, if someone had said 20 years ago, you know, it wouldn't the healthcare system save a lot of money if it just gave someone heroin and a pill? Well, that's sort of what we come to. Um, and it has very serious long-term consequences. It's going to take a long time to make go away and um, get that fixed. But, you know, it was that finding, too, that Anne and I call these deaths of despair, um, you know, just for a label. Um, and, you know, that suggests that this group is really, really seriously hurting. Um, you know, you can say, well, they're not that poor. Um, there's lots of opportunity in America, but, you know, they're killing themselves in, in ever larger numbers. They're taking these awful drugs and overdosing from them. And, you know, I don't think we understand what that is. Um, you know, we've talked about um, getting together with David Otter and looking at, you know, whether his correlations are the same as ours. But, you know, there's lots and lots of other explanations. And, you know, just about every presidential candidate in the primaries talked about that paper in some form or another. Um, and I could reel off the whole list of explanations they came up to with. Say, I'm tempted to say congratulations, but I'm not sure that's in order. <laughs> Well, this I'm not something. sure either. Yeah. So, well, you know, we did go to um, the White House with the other Nobel laureates and having Obama greet us and say, we've got to talk about this paper. It is sort of every academic's dream that yeah. um, you go to the White House and the president of the United States wants to talk about your paper and has read it very carefully indeed. <laughs> Um, well, man, man so, natu as your fellow Scotsman said, man naturally desires to not only to be loved, but to be lovely. And there's, that's one of the better examples of getting some love. I mean, that's pretty yeah. – that's a thrill. Well, uh, Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're, 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 you're hardwired to, to love it. We're hardwired to love it. Well, we treat it with the appropriate degree of this kind of thing. But um, – but, you know, who knows? There's been a big decline in religion. Um, you know, if you believe some people, it's a cultural failure among white people, which parallels the cultural people failure among black people 30 years ago. You know, if you're Bob Putnam, it's, you think it's to do with the collapse of opportunities for these people's kids, you know, which is something we haven't talked about and is a serious matter, um, or at least not collapse, but very much more difficult than it once was. Um, and, you know, it's not too easy for kids to move if their parents aren't moving and if the local school system is not what it once was. Um, you know, I remember Joe Stiglitz telling me that in his high school in Gary, Indiana, there were something like five National Merit Scholars in his year. Well, you know, now hardly anyone goes to college anymore from that school. And, you know, it's much harder for the kids to get out of them for their parents. So I wonder what know, happened. There's just, I I wonder what per expenditure is per student in Gary, Indiana today. It's probably gone up. Yeah. It's probably gone that's not, that's up. not that's the problem. Like yeah. That's, no, well, it's not the problem. I mean, it is a problem in the sense that it, to make it much better would take more money. But if you put more money in, it would not make it much better, like a lot of problems yeah. there in, you go. in the world. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, there's just a lot of things like that lurking in the background. There's been a huge upsurge in pain, which we don't understand either. 
you know, and it may be that, you know, if you get pushed out of a nice job at an IBM and you're now working at McDonald's, you have a lot of more lower back pain than you did before. And, you know, these are things we're working on. Yeah, I think these are questions that are better answered perhaps by sociologists. I don't think I'd ever utter, utter that sentence, let alone on Econ Talk, but um, getting at the, the underlying causes of, of that um, – of some of these problems is is not going to show up. I don't think in the current population survey, it's going to show up in somebody going door to door or house to house or city to city, town to town, and trying to figure out what's going on in the people's lives on the ground. If you're going to really make the case that it's deaths of despair rather than something else yeah, that, you know. I agree with that. But that's why studies like, um, you know, Matthew Desmond's and, um, Kathy Edens are so valuable because they've done that. I mean, Desmond went and lived in a trailer park for a year, you know, um, rented property in the Black Ghetto in Milwaukee. And, you know, they've done that ethnographic work. And you don't necessarily want to buy the macro stories that come with their work, but the work itself is immensely valuable and it's amazingly um, full of, I'm full of admiration for people who are prepared to do that. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I need to look at, I don't know either of those books or the Thoreau book, and I look forward to looking at all of them. And another book that's getting a lot of attention these days is the J.D. Vance book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, I think is yeah. the title. And I think I it's obviously it. on the same terrain, uh, generally. Terrain, but very different view. Yeah. Much yeah. Uh, further to the right, but uh, a deeply felt experience and very impressive book. Can I come back to a remark you made about Europe? Um, you made the point that, that, Europe feels, a lot of Europeans feel, um, I would call it, unrepresented, dispossessed. And they have a very different political system typically in, in many European countries than we do. Uh, they have ceded some power to the EU, which is inherently uh, not particularly representative. But I think the other issue, which seems to me to be really important that doesn't get enough attention, is what I would call heterogeneity. So mm -hmm. when people feel, quote, I'm not being heard or I'm not being represented – that's a lot more important when you have an incredibly diverse country like the United States compared to, say, Norway. So Norway is small. It's incredibly homogeneous. So there's not going to be a lot of political malaise. There's not going to be a lot of people who feel like, you know, what's in? Where, where's my share? Where's my goody out of um, Oslo or out of the equivalent of Washington and whatever capital is, is we're talking about in Europe? And I, so much of it, it seems to me, is that I mean, I desperately want to get more stuff personally. I, my philosophical view is I want to get more stuff out of Washington so that politically power, powerful people can't steer it toward themselves because we are a diverse country. And by definition, there's nothing that's good for us. There's things that are good for me, not so good for you, great for her over there. And it just seems to me that in a diverse country like ours, increasing political power in Washington – it's going to increasingly lead to this kind of uh, disaffection and anger. Yeah, um, there's a lot of stuff in there, and I'm ambivalent about at least some of it. The Norwegians, you know, are not so happy because the, the, there's been a lot of discussion about this so-called Norwegian solution for Brexit. Yeah. And, you know, the Norwegians effectively have to obey all the rules of EU without having any vote in the EU. So... You know, that's sort of like we're back to the Montana situation yeah. or something. And also, I don't know how much um, Scandinavian noir mystery novels you read, but there's sort of full of anime and concern about immigration and lack of homogeneity. Um, and Sweden has been enormously generous in doing what none of the rest of us will do, which is having an aid policy that allows foreigners to come and live in Sweden. Um, and it's produced tensions too. So I'm not sure that I think the homogeneity of those countries can be overstated. Um, it's also true, of course, that I think they're much more different one from another than is the case across the United States. You know, if you get an off an airplane in Budapest, it doesn't look the same as when you get off an airplane in Madrid. And whereas in the United States, the first approximation, it does sort of look the same. That's not to say that there aren't lots of variations. And I think that's been clearly a problem, which is, you know, if you're ruled from a 
not very democratic EU um, in Brussels, it's even worse than Montanans or Alabamans being ruled from Washington, where at least we do have a lot more in common um, than they do that. But I mean, I do think you're seeing this thing that, you know, Rawls would have called it this tyranny of supranational rule because you, you just, there's no way of doing it that doesn't tyrannize someone. On the other hand, you know, <laughs> there are clear examples where if you don't have federal control, awful things are going to happen and have happened, like civil rights being an example. Yep, no, they're trade offs for sure. Um, let, let me. Let me raise a um, a policy space to see where you where you come down. So, well, that's a terrible sentence. I don't know what I meant by that. I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to shift gears because I want to hear what you think about the following. Um, l- let's accept as a fact that there are large numbers of people in the United States who are struggling, whether it's for meaning, whether it's financially. Some of it, I've argued, is a result of the way we measure income over time and household structure. And so that's also going on at the same time. But put all that to the side. Everybody would agree that there are some people who have a tough time. It could be because of trade, that they're having financial difficulties because foreign workers compete with them more directly. It could be because of immigration. They come here and compete with them more directly. It could be because of technological change that a skill that they once had is no longer of value, or it could be cultural. They're doing okay, but they don't, for whatever reason, their job does not give them much satisfaction and, and, and meaning in their life, or other institutions have withered that once gave them or their parents meaning in their life. Whatever the answer is, what? The actual reasons determine what our policy might be if we wanted to help these folks. But it seems to me that improving the education system is a winner if we know how to do that, no matter what the cause. Would you agree with that? Yeah, um, I would. And um, I've come to realize that more and more um, over the last year or so as we've been talking about these things. Um and it's something I, you, you and I talked about the great escape. And, you know, one of the great things that's missing from the great escape is enough discussion about education. And um, I don't know very much about education. And um, it doesn't seem like we've been very successful in making it happen, though, um, in those communities. And, you know, I was very impressed by Bob Putnam's book and just this argument that a kid like him who grew up in, I guess, Port Clinton, Ohio. Um, his argument is that, you know, he could go from there and be a tenured Harvard professor and a very distinguished political scientist and sociologist, but that the chances of that happening now are very remote. And he's arguing, and I don't know if it's true, but he makes a plausible case that the inequality of opportunity has much decreased in the U.S. And you don't know that until you wait 50 years or 25 years and see what the correlation between fathers and sons or mothers and daughters' incomes are. And he's sort of impatient and says, well, let's look at what's going on now and let's look at these mechanisms and they seem to be breaking down. And I think it would be terrific if we could stop that because, I mean, we've talked about this at various points about, you know, we have this very dynamic economy. If it's not working for you in Montana, you know, go to Arizona or go somewhere else. Um, But it's hard to do that for kids. And, um, you know, if you're in you mean you mean uh, mean an 11 year old? Yeah, an 11 year old, you know, and I think for me, um, you know, that period of my life from sort of seven to 14 or something was an incredibly important period. And I was lucky enough to have terrific educational institutions, even though we had no money and we were just desperately scraping by the educational things. And so the sky was the limit. I could go anywhere and I did. Um, and, you know, Joe Stiglitz the same. So... It it really would be a bad thing if it is true. And I don't think, you know, Sputnam knows that he's not nailed it, but it's very, very suggestive um, if it were true that we can't do that anymore. 
Yeah, well, it also makes Harvard education a lot less interesting than it would otherwise be as well. It's not just a result. It makes what education? Harvard education. You know, the, the, if, if everybody who teaches at Harvard grew up in the uh, suburbs of Boston, in the wealthy yes, suburbs yes. of Boston, I think that's another factor. It makes it, you know, people would argue mainly they'd worry about the effect on inequality, but it also is a, there's a literal quality issue there of, you know, background and um, – well, that's okay. Other so schools. actually, I think that's not true because, um, and in economics, I know the numbers, and in other subjects, apparently the same. I mean, you know, something like in in the Princeton economics department, the last time I counted, there were thirty five different countries of birth, um, and that's happening throughout academia in the U.S. So um, that, to some extent, is substituted for yeah. domestic opportunity if that is what has happened. And I think it's actually very important and under-recognized that there's been this huge shift um, in American academia um, that comes um, with globalization. But, you know, I went to the opening exercises at Princeton a couple of years back, and, you know, they give the prizes to all the underclassmen um, and women. Um, you know, because the seniors got them when they graduated. And they read out the schools they've been to. And both Anne and I were just astonished by the extent to which they were private, you know, well-endowed American private schools. Yeah, well, there, there's some truth to that. Um, and it's some of it's probably an artifact of the baby boom and the desperation with which people are trying to squeeze their kids into the handful of first-rate schools, which there can only be a handful by definition if you only care about relative quality and not absolute quality. And um, it's a challenge. And also inequality powers that up too. I mean, there are a lot of very rich young people with small kids. With what? With small kids. Meaning? Well, I mean, it's, if if you look at New York City where my son lives, for instance, you know, the competition to get into no. even kindergarten yeah, no. is cutthroat. And it's not as bad in other cities, but you see it everywhere to some extent. Yeah, no, that's true. No, it's it's worse there, but it's bad in lots of places. Uh, well, let's close with with some optimism and cheer if we can find it. Um, we, <laughs> we both are we both are, are somewhat, I suspect, um, uncertain about our ability to either change the quality of the American school system or to get those changes that we might desire in place. Do uh, you think anything else could happen in the short or medium run that's going to help people cope with the kinds of changes that are coming in technology, perhaps, if not trade? Uh, as, as one econ talk listener pointed out to me, the otter effect, uh, the China effect is probably a one-timer. You know, it was the result of hundreds of millions of Chinese moving to cities and wanting to work in factories it maybe accounts for us. It's still only a portion of the changes in manufacturing. The automation has got to be more important, right? Right, I think and it that's is. that's not going to go away. Well, that's and true. That's gonna... So what's, uh, um, got anything to be cheerful about? Well, I'd like to see much more attention paid to campaign finance reform than has to paid to campaign finance reform. I don't think we can have a very good um, politics when congressmen and senators spend 80% of their time raising money. And it affects, you know, what sort of voices are heard in Washington. And I think that certainly contributes to the problem. You wanted me to be optimistic, and I'm not very optimistic that that might happen, but it would be really good if it were on more people's radar. I couldn't disagree uh, more. Um, I, I, I can't, really? I can't uh, to, to think that that would, first, I'm not even sure it's going to improve things, but secondly, I don't think it gets at the underlying problems in an important way. I don't think the the Congress people people in Congress don't have enough time to solve our problems is not to me the problem. So whether they have the incentive to do it, you could argue is a result of the money, but I don't know. I just think there's deeper things going on here that um are not related to Washington. Certainly the perception is though. That part I agree with. Yeah, well, people don't feel they're being well represented by people who are beholden to interests that they think are very opposed to them. And I think the perception is a big problem in its own right because not perceiving that you're well represented is a diminution of liberty in itself. I agree with that. Uh, so, anyway. 
Well, um, but I do think the dynamism of the place and the fact that, um, you know, there are, a, you know, there are lots of people who are doing very, very well. And I think, for instance, my own subject, which I know best, um, I think it's been approved immeasurably by this influx of all these people with different backgrounds. And that part of globalization, I think, has just been wonderful. And it's made economics an infinitely more interesting subject than it used to be. Well, let's close on that somewhat cheery note. My guest today has been Angus Deaton. Angus, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you very much, Russ. It was a pleasure as always. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.